beginning in verse 1. Deuteronomy 12. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord your Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings, and your sacrifices, and your tithes, and heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds, and of your flocks, and there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about so that ye dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and heave offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters, and your men servants and your maid servants, and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee, and the unclean and the clean may eat thereof as the roebuck and as of the heart. Only ye shall not eat the blood, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. And I think I'm just going to leave it there, actually. We'll begin talking about the first portion of Deuteronomy chapter 12 after a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this day, Lord. I pray, God, you'd be with us. We've read a portion of your scriptures, Lord. Only you can give power to it. Only you can expound upon it as you desire. Help our hearts to be receptive, Lord. Help our mind to be clear. Lord, I've prepared notes, but God, you do according to your will, and we'll trust you in that. Well, thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So Deuteronomy chapter 12 here, we're going to remember, as we often do, that just because there's a chapter break doesn't mean that God's necessarily changed topics, or he's not continuing a thought that carried on from before. And we even see that throughout this chapter, halfway through, one would think there should be perhaps a chapter break, but instead you just, maybe some of you have, uh, a paragraph sign or symbol there at verse 17. Regardless of that fact, just look for a minute as a reminder at chapter 11 and verse 26. Chapter 11, verse 26. It says, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a, be a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And again, as you read through Deuteronomy, you're going to find constantly God is just challenging his people to choose. Here's a blessing if you obey. Here's a curse if you disobey. 
And God's being so clear that as you read this, oftentimes it almost seems monotonous. Why is God repeating this so often to us? He's repeating it because it's important and because we are so soon to forget the things that God has commanded us. And so here in Deuteronomy, which in itself is a repetition of the law, he's repeating things that he has already said to us. He says here there are statutes and judgments. You ought to observe to do them in the land. And that's how verse 1 of chapter 2 starts. These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land, which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye live upon the earth. Now, we see that these laws are, of course, true, right, just, pure, clean, and enduring forever, according to the Bible at large. And yet, at this time, God is indicating that currently in his land, they are not being observed. So he challenges these as they go forward to observe these as they enter into the land. Now, before verse 2, before we get there, let me read again Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 22, where it says, If ye shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourself. Here God is making it very plain that if obedience is maintained as they enter into the land, if they follow his commands on top of the blessings that they shall receive just in general, he's promising to remove the inhabitants before them as they go in. Verse 23, Then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you. As they go in before them, these nations are being removed. And so by the time you get to Deuteronomy chapter 12, and in verse 2, watch what God is commanding them to do. It says, Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains, and upon the hills, and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars, and break their pillars, and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods, and destroy the names of them out of that place. Now notice what's missing there. The people, the inhabitants. God says enter into the land and the first command that he gives them is you are going to utterly destroy their things. No mention of the people. Why? Because if they had faith to believe God when they entered in, then verse 23 would automatically be fulfilled. As they entered in, the others would be removed instantaneously. They wouldn't even have to worry about the men, these other nations, these armies, these people that are greater and mightier than them, as the Bible records. They wouldn't even have to just give it a thought. They could just believe God, enter in, and they would empty, or they would enter into an empty space. All that would be left then is the places, the altars, the pillars, the groves, the graven images, the things that these used in their worship, the items, and also at the end of that verse 3 it says, the names of them who, not the people, but the gods that they serve, God wanted them to remove their religion, and yet he had... He had no desire to command them at this time to remove the people themselves. Why? Because they would already be handled by God if they would only believe and enter into that promise. So the items, again, the places, altars, pillars, groves, graven images, they would be left there, and it would be up to then God's people to go and destroy them, break them down, burn them with fire, rid the land of them, and get the names of these gods out of that land. Look in chapter 11 and verse 25. It says, There shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that ye shall tread upon as he hath said unto you. As, even as I said, God says. He, he said, as I told you, they will have a fear. Earlier in Deuteronomy, he talks about hornets going in and driving them out. But here it's just mentioned the fear of them, the dread of them, the knowledge that these people belong to the Most High God. So much so that as they're fleeing, they're not even going to grab the trinkets and stuff of their false gods. They know it will be no help. They know it will be no 
relief from the power of God and his people as they enter into the land. And so the people just flee, or at least that's what they were to do. If, if, the, if the people of God followed by faith what God is setting before them at this time, the Lord will handle the people. No man shall stand before the people of God if they're believing and trusting and following after him. The command then was simply to cleanse the land, or that place, as God calls it. He says, cleanse that place. You shall utterly destroy all the places, and you shall rid the names of them, these gods, out of that place. He says, high mountains and hills and under trees is where you would specifically look and remove the name and remembrance of these gods from those places. God, God pretty much indicates that you're going to have to sweep the land. Go to every tree. Go to every high place. Go to, it's like these people had their gods and they just stored them away in different places. Tuck a god here, leave a god there. Very superstitious were the folks here that were inhabiting the land, these heathen. He says, go to these places, search high and low, and any altar, any pillar, any grove, any graven image, get rid of it. Destroy it. Verse 4 then continues and says, after he gives these commands of them to them, Verse 4 says, Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. So rather than destroying what is required in serving God, rather than breaking down and ridding yourself of the name of the Lord God, you are to keep Him. You are to remember Him. And God often brings this up throughout the Scriptures. Remember, remember, remember. Go back to chapter 8 and verse 18. Chapter 8 and verse 18 says very clearly, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it's not just power to gain wealth that God gives us. It's power to overcome. It's, it's power to, to, uh, to, to quit sinning. It's power to believe more. It's power to cleanse your life. It's power to lead your family. It's, it's, it's all these things that God gives people power to do, and he does it if you would only remember him. Call him to remembrance. Have him as the forefront of thy thoughts as you go. God says, thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Don't do like you're doing to these people's gods, but rather remember me. And that, on top of that, keep his place, okay? So God has just commanded, rid the land, rid the land of things and the names of these gods. Don't do the same unto me. Rather, keep and remember me. And also, keep this my place. Look at verse 5. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come, and thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. God's indicating that that place will be cleansed before he names it his own. And once that takes place, now God says, hey, this is the place that I chose, and this is what you ought to do to that place. Bring then your offerings or your gifts. Bring then your sacrifices or your service to him. Bring your tithes. And here we can take this scripture and then apply it to ourselves. Of course, he's talking to an Old Testament people under an Old Testament law in an Old Testament physical nation that they were being brought up to become. But obviously, we can take all of these things and apply them to ourselves. Where God chooses and where God bids come then was for the Old Testament, the tabernacle, and that's where they assembled, eventually the temple. Now God says... Where he chooses, where he wants you to come, bring and do the same things. And that's the church house. That's the assembly. Whether we're in a building, in the street, in a nook, wherever we meet and assemble, we ought to do the same things that are being explained to us by type here. So what is God highlighting? There is a specific place that he has chosen to perform specific religious duties and he has not changed his mind though some of the structure has changed a little bit so offerings 
bring your gifts, bring your offerings. You know what that is? Burnt offerings and sacrifice. These things that are brought of your own free will, and God mentions it there even in verse 6, above and beyond what is expected of you. In other words, out of the goodness of your heart, the movement of the Spirit of God, out of, out of what God has provoked you to do, offer unto Him gifts and sacrifices. Obviously, the best offering and gift that we can give to God is ourselves. Present yourselves a sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. That is reasonable service, according to the scriptures in Romans. Reasonable is bringing yourself and offering yourself in labors. But other things could be gifts of financial, could be gifts of stuffs, could be gifts of provisions for the ministry. Whatever it is, an offering is a willing gift that you present to God in order for his service to go forward. I've known lots of people in church throughout my days, and some people had lots of money, and they were able to give money as part of their offering or sacrifice unto the church. Some people didn't have so much, but maybe they had a skill. They were a mechanic, and they, they could fix the preacher's car, or they were, they were really good with plumbing, and so they'd go into the building, and they would check all the plumbing, make sure it was working right. Those were the types of sacrifices and offerings that people had given. Offerings, then gifts, sacrifices, or service, both of those come by way of our free will. You won't find a command of God in the scriptures that says ye ought to give an offering of this much, right? It's often left up to your free will, and when you do so, God sees your heart in these things. Gifts and service are both things that are part of the congregation, and that is the place that God has chosen to come and to do these things. The other one is tithes. I won't go into that in great length, but the New Testament teaching of tithes is that they were never excluded. There was nothing in the Bible that said, okay, now this is going to stop. But what I do see in scriptures is actually a free will offering, because a lot of people will say, okay, tithes ended in the New Testament, and you never see a command to tithe 10% of your income unto God in the same way that you see it in the Old Testament. And I will say fair, but what you actually do see in the scriptures then, I can kind of spin this around on somebody, is a willing, a willing giving of your heart. Remember the widow? She gave of all she had, which was only but a mite. So she didn't tithe 10% or offer 10% or sacrifice 10%. No, she gave it all. And God looked at that and said, this widow has cast in more than y'all. Looking at Pharisees that had great wealth, looking at religious folks that had great wealth, and them casting in of their much, this widow of her penury cast in but a little in their sight, which to God was a great sacrifice, a great gift. She gave all that she had. And so that's the New Testament teaching. I would say that the New Testament teaches to go beyond giving of 10% into the congregation and into the work and into the labor. Here, it, pre it presents the idea that you're giving of yourself. And if giving of yourself before God and you've worked it out with them and you've prayed about it is 10%, amen. If giving of yourself of, 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 is, is been worked on and prayed out with God and it's only 5%, amen. God sees your heart. You've worked it out with him. I don't preach long or often on the tithe because I don't think that the tithe needs often to be preached on. I think everybody has been worked on with God. Everybody has had these conversations with God. We come to a point where the Bible starts accentuating and highlighting giving, and we all get a little bit uncomfortable. I'm, am I giving enough? Am I not giving enough? I don't know. You pray about it. You ask God. You work it out with God. And whatever you think fits that description in the book of Romans, presenting yourself holy and acceptable unto God, that's the sacrifice, that's the reasonable service. Whatever you and God conclude is, is that, do that with all your might. Do that with your whole heart. Do that in faith. And God will bless you as a result of it. I've been through seasons like this with, with tithing and offering where I felt like God was really impressing on me to give a little bit more. And so I prayed about it and we worked through these things. And then God sometimes has brought me through seasons where he's like, okay, we're working in this direction. How about you give me some more time here and a little less money? And then we kind of worked out a thing there where we were kind of working together with God. If you're honest with God, if you're honest with yourself, you know what you have to offer. You pray about it and God works in your heart to do a certain thing. It will always be enough, okay? It'll always show itself as good works 
and whatever you do unto God here, you will receive a reward of tenfold up there. So there's another encouragement to us. I know it's not all about gaining rewards, but it's about having a good walk before God. But God promises that whatsoever you lose, give, uh, come short of, has taken from you in this life, God will reward you much more in heaven if you're doing things heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Again, that's why I don't beat up on tithing or talk about tithing a lot because I don't want you to serve God and worship God. And I believe offerings and tithes and giving is a form of worship. But I don't want you to worship God because I tell you to or because some other man tells you to. I want you to worship and serve God because God told you to. And you know your heart. God knows your heart. So I'm certain you can come to a conclusion about what you ought to do. And then it's just a matter of, like the Bible says here and constantly in Deuteronomy, trusting him and obeying him. Behold, he sends a blessing and a curse before you. The blessing comes if you obey whatever you've agreed on as far as giving and sacrifice and tithes goes. The curse comes when you kind of work something out or maybe you're not really listening and you disobey God. That's where the curse could roll in, okay? And I don't need to get involved in those things because God surely has that department of your heart managed. Amen? <clears throat> we continue on in verse 7. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your household, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So here he promises, and again, we're going to extend the teaching, which is obviously God choosing a place to put his name there, where people would come and they would perform their offerings, their sacrifices, their vows, and their givings. We can take what we're learning here and apply it directly to this, the meeting house, the congregation, the church as a whole, the assembly. Okay, he says that that place where he chooses to put his name there, he bids you come and there perform certain religious duties. Okay, in verse 7 then, he talks about some what's and some who's ought to be involved in this. He says there you ought to what? Eat. Now we know that the Bible says man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We think of eat, and as Baptists, we like the potlucks, and we like the cookouts, and we like the cake, and we like all of those good things. And they are good things. Come together, break bread. That's a great spiritual activity. We don't often think much about it because it's just feeding our bellies sometimes to us, but it's a spiritual activity. Look at how many times the Bible records men breaking bread together. How many times the Lord had assemblies of his inner circle, 12 apostles, and they broke bread together. Yes, come and eat together, but understand we don't live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so, amen, we come and we hear the word of God. And I try to put lots and lots of scriptures into my sermons because that's my ultimate desire is that you wouldn't necessarily grab a hold of my thoughts or my ideas or my opinions or my interpretations, but rather you would hear the word of God and maybe it preaches something different to Brother Raj than it does to Brother Jamie. And I'm not really knowing that because I've just laid out the scriptures, told you my interpretation, and at that same moment, God's given you a revelation of something in your life personal. That's what it means to eat when you assemble. It's not bread, but every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God that you're bringing into yourself. And that ought to be a big part of our assembly. You ought to eat when you come together. Next it says, Eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto. In other words, if you're asked to read scriptures, if you're coming in and cleaning, if you're setting up and tearing down the, uh, the, 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 the furnishings and the food down there, if you, whatever you do, you ought to rejoice in what you've put your hand unto. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. You ought to have a good heart and a good spirit whenever you are coming to the place that God hath put his name there. We are a Christian church. God's name is here. He bought this assembly with his precious blood. And so he says, come, and as you come, bring your offerings, bring your sacrifices, bring your tithes, bring your vows, right? He also says, eat before the Lord and rejoice in those things. And that's the what of this portion of Scripture. Continue on the second part of verse 7. It says, ye and your households. 
wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye and your house. That's the promise of that famous verse we use in soul winning. Thou shalt be saved and thy house if you believe in God, right? If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the same promise ought to carry over from salvation into the assembly. Ye shall assemble, ye and your house. And so God here re requires and expects and wants for his place that he puts his name in to be a place of sacrifice unto God, serving God, eating the word of God, rejoicing in the things of God, and that you ought to do it with your whole house. This ought to be a place where your whole family, in as much as in you is to bring them, comes and assembles and rejoices and eats. And that's the, what God expects. And what God wants more than anything is that whole households would come here. Verse 8, you can continue. It says, Ye shall not do after the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Now, the command for the church, for the assembly, is that you would do all things decently and in order. There ought to be a structure to what happens here. It shouldn't be haphazard. It shouldn't be just come in willy-nilly, do what you will. Chairs are all over the place, people all over the place. Everybody comes at a different time. Everybody gets up, sits down when they like to, right? Someone's going to stand up and just break into a song while somebody else here is praying and somebody else is going to preach. No, everything ought to be decent and in order when it comes to the house of God. And so God, when he makes statements like, you shall not do after that we do here this day, he's saying and he's introducing the fact that he's about to put some order to some things. He's about to lay things in order. You remember the charge was given to Titus when he was to go into Crete that he should set in order the things that were wanting. There in Crete there were all sorts of churches and all sorts of situations and all sorts of ages where you would go into one church and maybe there wasn't even an appointed leader. No one really stood out. Things were a little bit haphazard and whatever. He'd walk into another church and it was clear. Here's a man that's standing in front of the group, leading the group and, 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 and preaching to the group. And he, he's, he's the clear leader. He saw all sorts of when he went there, I believe, but his main charge was to ordain elders, if there's one that stood out, and to bring things that are wanting to a state of order. And so God, I believe, here is about to do the same thing. And why do I believe that? Because he just contrasted what they were doing with what they ought to do. What they are doing is the second part of that verse 8. It says, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. And if you want an example of whatsoever is right in your own eyes, go to the book of Judges. And you're going to find in the book of Judges some of the most depraved, wicked, lunatic things you've ever seen in your life. All sorts of demonic activity. Even from people that are lifted up as a prophet of God. Why in the world would Samson be doing such strange things? Jephthah, what are you thinking? Offering up your daughter as a sacrifice in order to win the battle. The problem was they were all doing what was right in their own eyes. They all had their own opinions of what was good, what was right, what was decent, what was orderly, and they just walked in their own will. And that's a big problem. For me, when I walk in my own will, I get into all sorts of trouble. And I think we could have a show of hands and amens going around the room if we'd admit ourselves. God's will is always better than my will. What is right in his eyes is always better than what's right in my eyes. And so God here wants to bring some order of service to the people Israel as he promises to bring them into the land. And he's going to bring them in easily. He's going to bring them in with no enemies. He's going to say, all you got to do is clean up the mess. And then I will lead you. But I will lead you. Other examples you can find of doing whatsoever is right in their, in their own eyes can be found in just modern Baptists in this area. People spend time in the scriptures by themselves or they start listening after different things on YouTube. Hey, I'm preaching to the choir here, okay? And they develop their own sense of what is right and what is decent and what is orderly. It's easy, okay? It's easy when you're preaching, when your church is a click away to ignore things that rebuke you. Okay? Does that make sense? It's easy to go on and look at a list of sermons from favorite preachers and go, 
Hmm, pride, ooh, don't want to listen to that one. Who? Alcohol, yep, not listening to that one. Okay, the sodomites, yeah, let's listen to that one. And we hear all sorts of preaching that really isn't going to impact our lives, really isn't going to correct us. But if we follow the order, and that is God chooses a place where you bring your tithes, bring your gifts, bring your service, come there to eat, come there to praise and rejoice, then God's able to work with individuals in his venue. Not what's right in their own eyes, but what's right in God's own eyes. And so do you know what happens to me quite often? Is I go home and I don't think of any of you. I pray for you, of course, but I don't think of any of you in preparation of the sermon, okay? But then we walk away and we have these discussions where you're like, oh, what you said there was just for me, and what you said there was exactly what I needed. And I, I made a decision today that I couldn't have if I didn't, pre- if I didn't hear that sermon preached. And that's not me, because I don't prepare that way. And I couldn't possibly know what each one of you are dealing with individually. So I prepare a message from the Bible. Today, it was just literally turning from chapter 11 to chapter 12. Sometimes, you've been here where I've literally just went like this and let it fall open and preach there. And some of those messages, for whatever reason, have been exactly what myself, exactly what my wife, exactly what individuals in here needed on that particular day. That can't be anything but the Spirit of God. That can't be anything but God saying, hey, do things my way and you shall be blessed. And so God sets the assembly, the place that he chooses for the church, and he does it so that men get his mind, his will, and they're not always getting and following after their own mind and their own will. When people follow after their own mind and their own will, we get those soul winners that refuse to serve. We get those that will go to conferences but will never commit to a local church. We get those that will take great big trips and go to the end of the world to get somebody saved, but they won't tithe. We get those that say, look at me, look at me, look at me, maybe not with their words, but with their attitude, and yet they will never love anybody. They will never reach out their hand to support and to bless anybody. That is right in your own eyes religion, and the Baptist movement is full of it. Everybody's got their own mind and their own thing. And, and, and this was me in my first, like, five years of being saved. So, similar to you, out of YouTube, right? Hearing truth come from unlikely sources. Finally submitting to that truth. Connecting the dots of all the influence that I had in my life leading up to that moment. When finally that seed was able to grow because I confessed my need and called on Christ. But I spent the next year doing what was right in my own eyes. Okay, I read tons of Bible. Okay, I prayed prayers. I didn't step into church, though. I didn't do things God's way. And if you ask my wife, I was a rotten person then. Because I was a rotten person, it made a great strain on our relationship. I understand that God promises that he will not bring peace but a sword. And so you get saved, and you're all, you're, everything's changing. You now serve the Lord where you used to serve other things, yourself, your wife, or whatever. I understand that those those natural divides are there. But if I would have done things God's way, if I would have been saved and in church and committed and and, and serving and sacrificing and tithing and, and eating and praising according to God's plan, I probably would have had more love, more compassion, more care for my wife who was worlds away from me in regard to coming to Christ. Of course, now she, she's, she's saved, but that took many years. And probably she had to recover from, from many hurts that had happened in that time when I was newly saved. Not doing things God's way, but doing things my way. <clears throat> Do what my way was? Start in Genesis and read the Bible. And I got this, like, wrath of God. God wants you to do this, do that, do this, do that mindset. Completely missing love and grace, the balance, right? compassion okay but you only get that when you get in a real congregation with real flesh and blood believers in a real building perhaps with mortar and bricks and you hear preaching that the spirit of god chose for you even as he chose the place for you that's the only way you get what god wants is to do things the way god desires we can continue on in verse 9 
For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. What he's saying here is the journey's not done. He said, I chose this place. When you enter into that place, you're just going to have a mess to clean up, nothing more. But he says, don't do how you do now. Don't act how you're acting now. In other words, you got to start reforming. you got to start repenting. you got to start changing some things because you're going from your way to my way. Isn't that a great example of the Christian life? You're going from your way to God's way. Sometimes we, we carry my way into the Christian life too, but that always ends up in failure. And that's what God's warning. <laughs> He's warning, you've not come to the inheritance. You've not come to the rest. You're not there yet. You haven't arrived. And so he's basically telling them, hey, don't do it your way. My way will work out better for you. And so he says, the journey's not done. Therefore, do what I say, not as you please, And I think sometimes, I, just, I, I don't know, I just think, think of this sometimes like a road map, right? When we look at the point A to point Z, maybe God wants us to go this way because he's kind of like Google where he's already figured out all the detours. He's already, he already knows that there, this road's blocked, and, 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 right? But I know that I need to go there. And when I do things my way and just ignore all the roadblocks, just what happens? Hang-ups, stoppages, delays, crashes, right? Obviously, Google's not omnipotent, but, but, but you know what I'm saying. God knows the way. All we have to do is follow. The journey's not done yet. You haven't entered into that rest. You haven't entered into the inheritance. So it's so important that we need to follow God. And that's why God is repeating himself. Because we have the tendency to do it our own way. And so God says, do it my way, do it my way, you'll be blessed. Do it my way, do it my way, do it my way, do it my way. We're like, I get it, Lord. And then we go and do it our way anyways. Okay, God's repeating himself. Then we'll be without excuse when we mess up, have to repent, ask for forgiveness. And he'll be like, I told you so. Now, nah, God won't rub that in your face. He'll forget it as far as the east is from the west and that help you out again. But we learn that lesson, hopefully. And hopefully we learn that lesson before we go and hurt everybody else around us and ourselves and our testimony and all those things that can come from disobeying God. God emphasizes because we don't listen. Verse 10 continues, and it says, But when ye go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall ye bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifice and your tithes and your eve offerings of your hand, and all your choice vows which ye vow unto the Lord. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants and the Levite that is within your gates for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you. Didn't God just say that three verses ago? The exact same thing. Look how closely he's repeating himself. Just highlighting the fact that you are not even listening to a word I'm saying right now. <laughs> he, just, he said it again. The same list with, with a little bit of clarity given there. He says... For, uh, before ye and your households. And then down in verse 12, he says, ye and your sons, daughters, men servants, maid servants, and the Levites, that's within your gates. He accentuates things, highlights it for more clarity, but ultimately he's indicating the same thing again. There is a chosen place where you perform chosen and specified religious duties with yourself and those who are yours and that is what he's laying forth. Don't do it any other way. This is how God wants you to do things. And we have a pandemic today, and it's not COVID-19. I'll say it again, just because God says it again, of Baptist believers that sit at home watching YouTube instead of getting into a flesh and blood bought by Christ church, and it's hindering them. It's hurting them. It's causing them to stumble, and they don't see it. You know why they don't see it quite often? Because they didn't pick that sermon that week. They picked the other one that was more comfortable for their flesh. Right? This isn't, this isn't some new thing. Either. This isn't some phenomenon amongst the, the internet churches that we know and love and follow now. No, this is a phenomenon that goes way back. Okay? Even before these internet churches sprung up, I was in a Baptist church and you had that same mentality from people except... Their Sunday morning was, you know, Joel Osteen or whoever was on this TVN, right? 
And then they would come into the Baptist church at night and, and get, you know, feel better about themselves. And if it was a sermon that hurt them, touched a little too close to home, you wouldn't see them for three or four weeks. And then they come back all happy again and ready. And, you know, maybe they like this sermon. They're like, oh, I love that, Pastor. That was a great sermon. That was a really good one. I loved how you just picked on everybody else's sins. And they walk away happy. And lo and behold, they're there the very next Sunday morning. So what changed? The fact of the message being personal, hitting too close to home. It, it tantalized their flesh. But the same thing is going to happen. As soon as they get offended, as soon as, as, soon as it's, it's not what they want, it's not what's right in their own eyes, they're going to go and do what is right in their own eyes. There's a chosen place to perform chosen duties with ye and yours, the Bible says. <clears throat> Verse 13 continues and says, Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. Okay? Not in every place or any place, really. Because that's, that's what the wicked heathen were doing. God literally had to say, check the high mountains, check the low hills, check under the trees, check in the, like, check everywhere. Because these people, these heathen people, just do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want, to whomever God they want. That's what their religion was based on. Whatever feels good. Whatever's right in my eyes. That's how they chose to do things. And it's sad that God's people are acting like heathen today. And it's sad that God had to reiterate this message to his people in that day. Because he knew that the heart of man is, above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know that heart? Well, God can. And he knew it enough to just say, hey, do it my way. Because I know that the opposite is true. You're going to go and do it your own way. That's why back in 11 in verse 27, chapter 11, verse 27, he says, a blessing if you obey. And that's just straightforward, the commandment of the Lord. Look at verse 28. And a will not obey. He could have left it there, but he said, look at the secondary side effect. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. That's the logical end. Obeying is just blessing all the time. Curse comes from disobeying, and it leads to more disobeying. And eventually you're serving other gods. Gods you didn't even think of serving starts with serving ourselves and what we have in mind as the our perfect form of religion whether we adopted that from what some man taught us or not it's still something we have adopted and it's become right in my own eyes and that's not right what god wants is always right verse 14 it says but in the place which the lord shall choose in one of thy tribes there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings and there thou shalt do all that I commanded thee. Again, don't just do whatever you want in any place. God's very clearly saying, do what he wants in his place. Okay, and for us today, we have the church of God, the assembly of Christ's believers, the body that's here in Toronto, in this part of Toronto. Maybe there are others around here. But to me, it seems few and far between. And so, a great blessing we have here to be able to assemble, to hear the teaching of God's Word, to hear doctrines that are familiar to us because we've been taught them not by men, but because the Bible's illuminated them in our eyes and revealed them to us. We have the great blessing of being able to assemble and do things God's way, in God's place. And how often do we just, ah, I'm not really interested. I'm going to do it my way. No, no, no. God chose this place. God chose this assembly. I believe God chose this church for such a time as this. Look at that. Not bragging, not boasting, but in all 75 churches in Ontario, we were the only one that stayed open without restrictions during the virus. Okay? That's a blessing. That, that, that's something that I believe there's still people out there, like this brother here, that hadn't even heard of us. Right? That if he had three, four, five, six weeks ago, maybe he would have been here. There's probably others out there that don't even know. Okay? But God knows. He chose this place. He chose this group for such a time as this. All we have to do is what he says. You know what he's going to do? Have all men flee us and be afraid of us. Have, move them out of our way. What do we got to do? Just get rid of the artifacts. Get rid of the, get rid of the sinful ways that they serve their gods. All we got to do is march out into this city and tell them about Jesus and bid them come. 
I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that, that, that God keeps giving me these timely messages. Look, <clears throat> I've been charged, I've been accused with being, being pushy, beating up on people, just constantly just, just breaking people down with church attendance, church attendance, be in church, be in the assembly. Be <clears throat> First of all, it's important. God says so. I decided that 10 years ago. Second of all, it's important because for a time there was nobody doing it. Third of all, how can I be accused of beating up and stressing and highlighting things, you know, being on hobby horses, when I literally just turned a page and told you what the Bible says? If anyone else has another interpretation of the scriptures that we have here, we can talk about that after. But I believe the clearest explanation of these 14 verses is God chose a place, he gave those people things to do, and he said, bring all your friends, all your family, all your loved ones, everybody here to rejoice, to serve me, and to eat of my word. I don't know how else we can interpret that in our economy, and in our time, in the day that we're living in, but that God has for us here a specific place that he has chosen with specific duties, where you're to bring everybody to meet with God. And he said, this is my way. Don't do what's right in your own eyes. Do it my way. When, the, when, when the, the government said shut down the church house, that was them doing things right in their own eyes. What was the mind of Christ in that? Meet here. In the place that he has chosen, with the people that he has chosen, who make up the body that he has chosen and raised up for such a time as this, so that you can do all these things that I have commanded you. God's the authority. And I believe he chooses the messages specifically for us who are assembled here today. And you've done right in his eyes by being here. And God promises a blessing for that. Amen?